Hi everyone, welcome to part three on my series of Mastering Shutter Speed for Beginners. And in part one, we talked about controlling shutter speed on your camera. In part two, we talked about uh, the relationship that shutter speed has with the amount of light reaching your sensor over time. Again, controlled by the shutter speed so that you can uh, work out your exposures. And then uh, we also touched on motion and that there's two kinds of motions. There is um, subject motion, meaning is the subject that you're taking a picture of moving. And then we also talked about camera motion or more commonly known as camera shake and how to reduce that using the reciprocal rule. So I wanted to pick up where we left off on the reciprocal rule because I didn't talk about image stabilization built into many of our cameras today. One of my viewers brought it up, so I thought I'd address it. And that is that uh, some cameras have stabilization built into the lens. They also have stabilization built into the body. Sometimes these things work together. And this can mitigate a lot of the camera shake when hand holding a camera so that you can still get tack sharp images, even at very low shutter speeds. Uh, for some people, they can hold a hand hold a camera, gosh, my goodness, like 30 to 60 seconds uh, without any camera shake. But the caveat is. Remember, there's two kinds of motions. There's camera motion or camera shake, but there's also subject motion. So when you're using image stabilization to get these very long shutter speeds or slow shutter speeds, uh, nothing in the frame should be moving if that's your intent. If you want a tack sharp image of the subject, it can't be moving either. And when you're taking pictures of people or your outdoors, even landscapes, uh, things are always moving. So I would say that the reciprocal rule is still valid for most types of photography. And I think it's just good practice to uh, use the faster shutter speed so that you can keep your images tack sharp and minimize any kind of motion blur, whether it's in the camera and or in the subject. So now let's talk about shutter speeds and the kind of impact it has on the images you're taking. And today we'll be focusing on subject motion. And I've taken the same scene here at different shutter speeds. The one on the left at a relatively fast shutter speed of 1 2 of a second. And you can see that we are able to freeze the action of the water as it flows through the rocks. And if I were to zoom in, you'd be able to see little water droplets and everything like that uh, and mist. And really, I think it's a nice picture as is. But if you want to be a little bit creative, uh, you can reduce your shutter speed down to one second. And now you can actually see the water flowing. So you have this sense of motion of the water flowing through the rocks. And a lot of people like this kind of photography as well. All right, now let's take a look at a few more examples here uh, where my intent was to freeze the action. And if you look at the image on the left, I forgot to put the camera in shutter priority. So what happened is, is the camera chose the shutter speed for me. And it's the correct shutter speed relative to the exposure or brightness of the scene but it was not correct for the intent of this image, meaning I wanted to freeze the action of the butterfly flying off of this flower. So one one hundredth of a second just didn't cut it. And as you can see, the butterfly is very blurry, even though everything else in the scene, uh, this flower anyway, is tack sharp. Now, if we look at the image on the right where I did use shutter priority and I specifically chose one three thousandth of a second, and this is a shutter speed I recommend for most smaller birds in flight. Uh, but as you can see, it didn't freeze the bird completely. There's still a little bit of motion blur here on the ends of the wing, which is okay. I think it, it looks nicer to show a little bit of motion or anticipation of motion in the scene uh, when birds are flying. But if I wanted to freeze the wing tips as well, I would have probably had to go to at least one five thousandth or one six thousandth of a second to completely freeze this bird. Now, when you're taking pictures of like animals at play and kids running around or or people playing sports, I think this is a good range between one one thousandth and one two thousandth of a second. Uh, it's still more than enough to freeze the action of these kinds of subjects and still get a very tack sharp image. Now, looking at this pair of images here, you can see there's a pretty big disparity in the shutter speeds. Uh, this image in the left at one four thousandth of a second is a picture of a tiny tree swallow. I mean, these birds kind of fit in the palm of your hand and they fly very, very fast. But because this uh, tree swallow is gliding, you can see that this image is tack sharp from wingtip to wingtip to tail to the front. And uh, had this bird been flapping its wings, 
then definitely the wingtips would have been blurry. Now this image on the right, I was able to get away with one thousandth of a second. And as you can see, everything is still tack sharp here. The fish, the legs, the beak, the eyes, the body. And there's just a little bit of motion blur here in the wingtips, which is okay. Uh, I, I like to show that anticipation of motion most of the time. But one of the reasons I was able to get away with a slower shutter speed is because larger birds like this eagle uh, don't move quite as fast, at least when they're not diving anyway. Um, and you can get away with slower shutter speed with larger birds. Uh, normally I would recommend like one two thousandth of a second or faster, but there are other reasons I was able to get away with a slower shutter speed. So let's talk about those. Now there's primarily three other factors that come into play when we're talking about freezing motion. Uh, and in this image here, there's actually five factors and I'll talk about them all. Uh, I was able to get away with one five hundredth of a second for this image for these three primary reasons, the speed, the distance, and the direction. Now this plane is actually moving pretty fast, right? At least 200 miles an hour. That would imply you need to use a faster shutter speed. However, because of its distance, this plane is still pretty far away from me. Uh, I was able to get away with a slower shutter speed. And uh, another thing that comes into play here is the direction of the plane. The plane is coming in my direction, right? Not quite as straight on as, say, the eagle shot in the previous image, but it is coming in my direction. And this also plays a role in being able to use a slower shutter speed. So as things are coming towards you or going away from you, this also allows you to use slower shutter speeds than you otherwise normally would. Uh, a good example would be like a train. When a train is coming towards you, you can probably get away with like one five hundredth of a second and still freeze that motion. But when the train is crossing in front of you, like if you're standing right at the train crossing and you're very close to it, you're going to have to use an extremely fast shutter speed uh, to freeze the motion of that train crossing the tracks. So when things are moving left to right in your plane, focus plane, you'll need to use faster shutter speeds. And then the other thing that comes into play again is the speed of the subject and the distance the subject is from you. Uh, now, another two factors that come into play in this scene is one is this is a fixed wing aircraft, right? It's not flapping its wings to fly. So with these kinds of uh, shots, like of planes, you can get away with slower shutter speeds because there's the, the object itself is not moving much. It's, it's just moving in one direction instead of all directions, like that picture of the Blue Jay. Uh, so you can get away with slower shutter speeds with fixed wing aircraft. And I also recommend uh, shots like of propeller planes, if it had propellers, to use slower shutter speeds so that you can still freeze the, the plane itself and get a tack sharp image of the plane, but then you'll get a nice blurring of the propellers themselves to show that the plane is actually flying. Because I always thought it looked a little strange when you take a picture of a propeller plane, but the, the propellers are not moving, they're frozen, right? Because you used a very fast shutter speed. And again, that's just personal preference, but I, I prefer to show a little motion in the propellers for a uh, propeller type craft. Now there's one other thing that comes into play here for this particular image, and that's image stabilization. My camera has very good image stabilization in the body, and I was at a 600 millimeter equivalent focal length. And normally the uh, reciprocal rule would dictate, as I recommended, you wanna use probably one two thousandth of a second for this image. But because the image stabilization of my camera is able to mitigate camera shake uh, due to, you know, hold, hand holding the camera and also because of the extreme telephoto focal length I was using, I was able to get away with one five hundredth of a second. Now, as I've been saying throughout the presentation, using a faster shutter speed is one of the best ways to get tack sharp images. And uh, when we look at these two images here, I'm not actually standing still. I'm actually walking towards the camera at a normal pace. And normally, you know, I would say 1 60th to 1 100th of a second would be okay when the subject's standing still. But if there's any motion at all, even the slow motion of just me walking at a normal pace, uh, we lose sharpness very quickly. So let me punch into this image. 
And if I zoom in here, if you look at my sunglasses and my forehead and everything, you can see there's definitely motion blur here. And this is caused strictly by the subject motion, in this case myself, and not camera motion because the camera was on a tripod. Now let's take a look at the second image. And as I punch in, you can see there's a lot more detail now in the picture. You can see the uh, details here in the bridge of the sunglasses, the hairs of my eyelashes, the pores of my skin, everything. So this is a great example where image stabilization and the reciprocal rule just do not come into play. And you need to use a much faster shutter speed. Whenever the subject is just moving even a little bit, you need to really crank up your shutter speed to make sure that your images and your subject is tack sharp if that's what you're going for. Now let's take a look at using slower shutter speeds. And normally you have to use slower shutter speeds so you can gather more light into the sensor to properly expose your image. Uh, but I also like to use slow shutter speeds when I have enough light, but I want to create more surreal or more creative type images like seascapes and waterfalls and other things. So let's take a look at a few examples. Now when you use slower shutter speeds, like in this scene here at six seconds, you can minimize all of the ripples and waves and everything that's going in the water and almost make it like a sheet of glass to create this reflection of the sky. I probably could have used a double or triple this shutter speed if I used an ND filter, but I was doing this uh, straight out of camera with no ND filters, and I was able to achieve a six second exposure. So this gives a very surreal look to the scene. So if you want to create these more artistic, creative images, uh, longer shutter speeds allow you to do that. Now this image on the left, I was using a 10 stop ND filter, which allowed me to get a 480 second exposure or eight minutes. And during that time, the clouds were moving over the top of the building, which created this very surreal look. And I like this juxtaposition against the very sharp angles and architecture of the building, which is not moving. And these are the kind of things you can do when you get into very long exposure photography and using very long shutter speeds. The image on the right, I was using simply a five stop ND filter and it was a very, very bright day, not cloudy at all. But the four second exposure still gave me sort of that surreal look in the sky while juxtaposed against the sharp angles of the building. Now let me show you a few more examples for long exposure photography that will hopefully inspire you to give this a try. But you can do things like zoom burst, another technique called intentional camera movement, sometimes called ICM, where you're actually moving the camera while the shutter is open. And then uh, light painting and panning and also I'll give you links to something called Empty Cities, which is really cool. Now this image on the left is a tree in my front yard when it was blooming last spring. And as you can see, the flowers in the tree are kind of blowing in the wind while everything else is kind of uh, still. Uh, there's some streaks in the sky from the clouds, but this is one of the things you can do when you're using an ND filter. Now the image on the right, I didn't need to use an ND filter because this was at night. And as you can see, we this, this was roughly about a 20-minute exposure, and as you can see, we can generate star trails uh, in the sky with very long exposure type photography. Another thing you can do with long exposure photography is light painting. Now, this image on the left is about a 10 or 15 second exposure where I was just popping a flash on different parts of the uh, camera and on the table to generate this image. And then the image on the right is uh, just an LED light that I used and I just kind of moved it around the camera for about 10 or 15 seconds and I was able to create this effect. Now this is a technique called zoom burst where you use a zoom lens to zoom in and out while the shutter is open to create this effect. Here's two more examples of zoom burst. The one on the left is a waterfall that I zoomed in on and then the image on the right is just a uh, building or city in Alexandria. Now the way I do zoom burst is just before I push the shutter button, I start zooming, then push the shutter button and let go and stop zooming. And like I said, you need to do this for two seconds. It just takes a little practice, but you'll be able to get some really, really cool effects. Now, this is another technique called intentional camera movement or ICM photography. But you use roughly a two second shutter again, but instead of uh, zooming in and out, you pan while the shutter is open. And you, again, you get these very surreal effects of the clouds smearing and everything. And this is actually a landscape of uh, the Shenandoah Mountains that I did. Now, the last thing I wanna show you is I can't actually show you because I don't have permission. And this is not the kind of photography I've tried myself before, but I want you to Google the terms that you see here 
uh, Matt Logue's uh, photos of Los Angeles, and also another one called Silent World, where they use very long exposures to eliminate all of the people and cars and everything in these very busy cities. And it's really something else. And I think there's also some links to videos from those pages on the behind the scenes on how they did that. But I definitely recommend you go take a look at these as well. So I hope you can see that shutter speed is more than just about controlling the amount of light that reaches the sensor for exposure, but that it also can be used very creatively. And I encourage you to go online and look at other photographers work that use these techniques like zoom burst and ICM and long exposure because they do a much better job than I do, quite frankly. But in any case, uh, this ends my series on mastering shutter speed for beginners. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this, consider subscribing, hit the like button. And uh, if you'd like to buy me a coffee, it sure helps me make these videos a lot easier. But either way, I appreciate you watching and hopefully we'll see you again soon.